Hey, Dr. Christensen here with you. What do all those thyroid labs mean anyway? You know, it can be really frustrating when things that are important to your health are not clear, and maybe they weren't explained very well by your doctor. Um, was it hypothyroidism? Was it Hashimoto's? You know, what's, what's going on? What about Graves' disease? So I wanted us to go through all these thyroid tests with you and help make sense out of them, help understand what they mean and how they look in these various conditions. And there's another tool that goes along with this. It's a calculator that allows you to enter in all of your tests and all your scores and get some really good personalized feedback. You can learn what are some most likely diagnoses. You can get some clear action steps and get some help along the way. Super excited to share that with you. I think it'll be a helpful thing. Um, let me dive in and talk about these markers and what they mean here. So for starters, there's the TSH, and this is your thyroid stimulating hormone. It's your brain telling your thyroid to work. And what it does is it causes the thyroid to grow additional cells. And the more underactive your thyroid is, the higher the TSH goes. And then vice versa. If your thyroid's overactive, the TSH goes lower to slow it down. The thyroid only works when it's told. So when the TSH is up, it's yelled at and it works hard. But when the TSH is low, it just goofs off and it quits. And that's okay. That's how your body can control it and regulate it. So what happens in the various disease states? Well, we define hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism based upon TSH levels. So if the TSH is clearly above 10 or more, that's overt hypothyroidism. And there's an in-between state between about 4.5 to 10 to where the T4 becomes relevant. So if the T4 is normal, and the TSH is up, and someone does not have symptoms, then that's called subclinical hypothyroidism. I want you to hear an important point. This is not me saying that everything is fine as long as you're not that high. I'm not saying that, because you can certainly have symptoms and have hypothyroid symptoms with your TSH lower. But we define hypothyroidism based on the TSH. So to be really precise, you're only hypothyroid when the TSH is above 10, or it's between 4.5 and, and 10, and the T4 is low. If you're between 4.5 and, and 10, the T4 is normal, that's then called subclinical hypothyroidism. And that's something that's a bit of an enigma, but it does seem to carry some medical risks to it. Now, when the TSH is low, we talk about hyperthyroidism, because remember, it's backward. So when it's below between 0.4 to 0.1, then we call that subclinical hyperthyroidism if the free hormones have not elevated. If you're all the way down, 0 0.001, then it's hyperthyroidism regardless of the free hormones. But in many cases, they do come up. So the main cause of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. That's an autoimmune attack that causes the thyroid to release too much hormone. And the main cause of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And many people have been told that they're hypothyroid, but they don't have Hashimoto's. And that's pretty unusual. That usually only occurs secondary to surgeries that have removed the thyroid or medications that slow it. Many that have Hashimoto's do not have measurable thyroid antibodies. They often do have changes on ultrasound studies, but it's possible they've not had an ultrasound done. So if you are hypothyroid, you probably have Hashimoto's unless there's some other cause. So a couple thoughts about hyper and low TSH. It is more normal during pregnancy to run a bit lower. Uh, and the subclinical hyperthyroidism to where the TSH is a little low, but the other hormones haven't elevated, that still is a risk factor. That still does raise the risk for heart damage, brain damage, and then just more total death. So I see a lot of patients to where their doctor will give them more thyroid hormone until they finally are not fatigued. But oftentimes, that pushes their TSH into that initial hyperthyroidism range. But the doctors will reason, if your hormones aren't up, if your T3 or T4 are not elevated, you must be safe. But sadly, that's just not consistent with the data. We have a lot of evidence from those who have subclinical hyperthyroidism to where the TSH is low, and they're not safe. It is a risk factor. So if you are only feeling well when the TSH gets low, you want to figure out why. It's almost like saying you can't really stay awake throughout the day unless you take a pack of caffeine pills. Like, well, that's not a long-term answer. I mean, for sure, that may be useful 
not really, I guess. It's just harmful. And the same thing for a thyroid overdose. Uh, it's not, not healthy for the body, and you want to figure out why it is you're so fatigued. That's all you can do to help prop you up for a little bit. Then we think about the free hormones and the, the hormones the gland releases. So the way it works, the gland takes a protein called thyroglobulin, it puts iodine atoms onto that, and it makes first one called T4. This is also called tetraiodothyronine, um, or uh, levothyroxine. And this leaves the thyroid, and your body takes the T4, removes an iodine, and makes T3 out of it. And this is then triiodothyronine. So both T4 and T3 are measurable. Your body does release some of both, a little, a little T3 and a lot of T4. Most T3 is made outside of the thyroid. So when we measure those, we measure those in two different ways. There's the total T4 or T3 and the free T4 or T3. Now if it doesn't say free or total, it's a total. The difference is that these hormones have an active chemical state and a lot of them can be bound up by carrier proteins, which makes them inactive. So the total is the active plus the inactive, the total of them all together. And the free is the active fraction. Now most people, if you know their total, you know about how much free hormone they have. But there's some cases to where they've got enough total, but the free is too low, or vice versa. Maybe their total is decent, but the free is too high. So free hormone levels are now preferable to the total, and really in all cases. And the free hormones, they do reflect hypo and hyperthyroidism, but only at the extremes. So only when the TSH gets really high, like usually well above 10, do the free hormones start to drop off. And only when you're really hyperthyroid do they start to elevate. So they're not helpful to see the subtle changes, and they don't change earliest. They're the last thing to change. They only change at the worst extremes. Quick reminder, we've got a calculator you can use to where you can plug in your numbers and get feedback on what your hormone levels mean and what kind of a diagnosis they would point towards. So thyroid antibodies are the next big category. And of those, we've got thyroid peroxidase, thyroid globulin, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, and thyroid receptor antibodies. And we'll talk about each of those. So thyroid peroxidase, I want to mention that first. This one has the tightest overlap with Hashimoto's. So most people with Hashimoto's do have high antithyroid peroxidase, but not all. Many do not. And the labs will call a small amount normal. So somewhere it's like below mid-30s typically. If you're below 32, they often say that's normal and it's negative. But it's still an attack against your thyroid to some degree, or it's a sign of risk for other problems and other autoimmune responses. So high thyroid peroxidase has overlap with rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and celiac disease, so it's relative in those ways. Thyroid peroxidase, when it's really high, like up in the four digits, it does also predict fertility risks. Um, not other factors are clearly known, but that's one we do know about. So if someone did see that they had Hashimoto's, they had high antibodies, but their levels were squared away, they were on a good amount of thyroid medicine, they felt better, the high antibodies still could impede fertility and it still could be worth working against. Apart from fertility, the antibodies are not known to affect health in other ways. So thyroglobulin, which we'll talk about, it's not known to affect fertility or anything else besides the thyroid. So no known non-thyroid dangers. I bring that up because many think hard about how can they lower their antibodies. And having them go down to zero doesn't even clearly predict remission from Hashimoto's disease. And it doesn't predict other changes to health. So I want you to put your efforts into things that affect you the most. And that's one that probably is not, not quite as critical. You know, think more about your day-to-day -day symptoms and how you can feel your best and get your health back again. So then we've also got thyroglobulin. Now, thyroglobulin is less consistently specific with Hashimoto's, but does also have overlap with arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and celiac. Now, both thyroglobulin and thyroid peroxidase also show up in Graves' disease. They can be there for Graves or Hashimoto's. In fact, up to half of people with Graves may have antithyroglobulin. And even as many as 80% of Graves may have antithyroid peroxidase. So they do overlap quite a bit. Then we think about thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. That's a mouthful, huh? TSI, they call it for short. So easy way to think about that is TSI is just about TSH. 
And that's kind of how it works in the body. So TSH is a healthy signal from your brain telling your thyroid to release hormone. TSI is an unhealthy signal from your immune system telling the thyroid to release hormone. So when there's too much thyroid hormone, your brain shuts off TSH trying to slow your thyroid. But TSI can keep making it work even if your body doesn't want it to. Now TSI is present in over 90% of the time when people have graves. There's a very, very small rate of false negative. Um, about 10% of the time it can be present in those that have Hashimoto's. Now I talked about how thyroid antibodies for Hashimoto's may not affect health in many other ways besides thyroid peroxidase and fertility, but thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin is not like that. When it's high, it certainly causes Graves, but it can also cause greater risk for Graves eye disease and also Graves dermopathy, you know, more of a skin disorder. So that's one to where it does matter to get the antibody down to help control other non-thyroid negative health outcomes. This one is not as common in other autoimmune diseases, about 18% of the time in type 1 diabetes, but not commonly seen in arthritis or celiac disease. Now last up, we've got a variation of TSI called thyroid receptor antibody. That's also called thyroid binding inhibiting immunoglobulin, if the other one wasn't enough of a mouthful. You know, it's pretty much the same thing. It's a slight variation on thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, but it's not as good of a predictor. So, over half of those with Graves will not have thyroid receptor antibodies, even though they've got TSI. It doesn't have non-thyroid effects, so we don't know if it really is relevant apart from that. And it's not commonly tested for with Graves because it's just less predictive. Okay, we've also got thyroglobulin. So there was antithyroglobulin, and that was one of the markers of Hashimoto's and Graves. So thyroglobulin is just that, but not the anti, and they are different things. So antithyroglobulin is your attack against the protein that forms at the backbone of thyroid hormone. Thyroglobulin itself is just that protein, and some of it is normal in the bloodstream, and it's proportionate to the rate of thyroid cell death. You know, thyroid cells, they wear out, they die, and new ones take their place. So the rate at which cells are dying is the amount of thyroglobulin in the bloodstream, and some is typical. This is most useful to help see what someone's risk would be for thyroid cancer or recurrence of thyroid cancer. It's got the best data when someone has had thyroid cancer and they had high thyroglobulin before they went on treatment. In those cases, you can measure thyroglobulin to see if their cancer came back to get more data about their risk of recurrence. It can also be high apart from cancer with goiter, nodules, or with Graves' disease. And the last thing is that if someone has ultrasound findings that are ambiguous, you're not quite sure if you should biopsy or do surgery, thyroglobulin can be a tiebreaker. If it were high, that would suggest that the problems were worse than you might think otherwise. And if it were low, it might give you a little more breathing room. Last up, we've got reverse T3. And this is last for a reason. <laughs> I don't really test it. Um, it's the normal byproduct of T4. Many have argued that reverse T3 blocks the effect of T3. And this has been thoroughly studied in all animal species. It does not. So reverse, what does that mean? Well, T3, you've got the thyroglobulin, you've got the iodines, and they're in a particular arrangement. Now, reverse T3 is the exact same arrangement, but it's a mirror image. So the same thing, but you can't, you can't put a left hand in a right glove. And the same way, reverse T3 won't work in a T3 receptor. So why do we even have it? Well, this is one more example of about how powerful thyroid hormones are and how many ways the body has to regulate them. When things work well, your thyroid spits out a lot of T4 and says, there you go, take it and do what you want to with it. And your liver does a lot of fine tuning. So your liver takes T4 and it makes enough T3, but mostly it makes reverse T3. Most of it is just a byproduct that the body never needs. So when it's high, that means that there's too much thyroid hormone, and that can mean that someone is making too much, they're taking too much, or their body cannot tolerate thyroid hormone and it's trying to get rid of it on purpose. But there's no cases in which T reverse T3 is high that it's high by accident, or that it shouldn't be high. The most common scenario by far is just someone taking too much thyroid hormone. 
or they've got hyperthyroidism from Graves. And in those cases, the remedy is you shouldn't take so much. You gotta lower the dose or lower how much the body is making. And you see that before the T reverse T3 elevates by seeing the TSH get lower. So once the TSH is low, below range, you know there's too much thyroid hormone there. You don't need reverse T3 to tell you the same thing again. And it's just one more test that ends up costing patients money and insurance doesn't want to pay for. So the other scenario is if someone's body cannot tolerate thyroid hormone. This is called euthyroid 6 syndrome. And this is most commonly seen to occur in intensive care units. That's where someone is held for a period of time, but they're not stable. They've got late stage heart disease or kidney disease or severe inflammation from some cause and their body can't keep up with a normal metabolic rate. So intentionally, the body tries to slow its metabolism by getting rid of hormone, by getting rid of thyroid hormone and making more reverse T3. So in that case, the solution is not to take more T3. Your body doesn't want that. Your body wants a break. The solution is to figure out what that cause is and take care of that. So reverse T3 is not a real game changer. It doesn't really shift treatment options from, from my treatment. So those are the main thyroid markers. I'm happy to explain those things to you and glad, hopefully that was helpful. I'm really excited to have made this thyroid calculator for you. You can plug in all your numbers, you can find out what they mean, and you can get personalized guidance on what your best steps are. So please enjoy that and make use of that. And share that with friends who might be concerned or frustrated or confused about their thyroid labs. They can get answers instantly and you can be their health hero. <laughs> uh, Dr. C with you here. Take great care. I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.